let me welcome uh, Kevin now for a great speech again. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for all of you being here, and thank you to Velux for the invitation to be here. Um, so my topic here is the rise of human-centric lighting, a term you may have heard, and one that I'd like to um, provide a little bit of insight on or get to the bottom of. So three things I'm going to talk about in the short time that I have here on the stage, which is the context for human-centric lighting, which I, I want to place this phrase and this idea in a general context. I want to define the term. And then finally, I want to talk about the opportunity for what I'm referring to here as integrative lighting, which I'll also define. So the context in general for me is actually applied lighting first from a vision point of view. Um, so I want to place on the screen here what I consider to be the four dials that a lighting designer or an applied illuminating engineer would be manipulating in the design of the luminous environment for the traditional role of light in the visual environment, which is for vision. So to say a little bit about these things, um, and, and by the way, these things are all integrated, so I'll show them in that way. So a spatial pattern is really the distribution of light, distribution of illuminance or luminance in the field of view. The temporal pattern is how we present light at different times during different times of day. It may be bright at one time of day, dimmer at another time of day. Light spectrum, I think you're all aware of. We can have light that's very colored, or we can have variations in white light from very warm to very cool. And finally, light level is just the absolute intensity, bright or dim. Now, while all of these things can be manipulated by a designer independently, often in the practice of design, we do them in an integrated way. So for example, um, at night, when we go home to our private residence, we might have warm lighting under low light conditions in a spatially non-uniform way. Versus during the daytime in an office building, we might have relatively higher light levels perhaps relatively cooler light levels, and probably more uniform light distributions. And so while we can think of these as independently manipulatable, often for the purpose of lighting design applications, we, we, we roll these things together and nest them together. I'm going to come back to this same slide a little bit later in the context of light and health rather than only in the context of light and the visual environment as I talked about now. So human-centric lighting. First, let me, um, it's a relatively new term. So this is a plot from Google Trends. So Google Trend is every time you go to Google and you put a phrase in the search bar, Google tracks the phrase. And so the first time human-centric lighting was put in the Google search bar enough times to register was sometime in 2012. And we can see since that time, human-centric lighting, that three-word phrase collectively put in there, has been rising in use. I think there's uh, a couple things that go along with this. So when the phrase human-centric lighting first came into use in, say, 2011, 2012, um, it was actually used as a proxy for high correlated color temperature lighting without really any type of health overlay on top of that. Um, later, I believe it became essentially a euphemism for lighting quality. Um, at about this same time, there was increased awareness of the health benefits associated with light, at least within the architectural lighting community. I think the photobiological community understood this well before the lighting community. Um, but then with this rise of awareness in non-image forming effects or, or non-visual effects of lighting, um, the trend for human-centric lighting is growing. And I, and I think we're going to see this continue to rise. Um, overlaying on top of this now is the Google trend for lighting quality during that same time period. And maybe since roughly 2017, we see that lighting quality is actually being reduced in at least the Google search, um, and human-centric lighting is increasing. So in some way, I think uh, the phrase human-centric lighting is almost being used as a replacement for lighting quality, but at the same time with this new added dimension, which is related to light and health. All right, so I'm making an assertion here that the phrase human-centric lighting is a marketing term. It's not a scientific term, but it's a marketing term. Let me give some evidence for that. So this is some data from a, from a marketing, Global Market Insights, a marketing company, that documented that in 2018, $1.3 billion, and they're projecting that the market for human-centric lighting is going to significantly increase in the coming years. I don't think the market for lighting in general is going to increase. Uh, it will, of course, by a small percent, but not by this large margin. Essentially, what this means is products that are now 
basically ordinary lighting products are going to get a stamp on the box that says they're human-centric, they're going to be sold as human-centric, and in that way, human-centric lighting is going to be rising. And I don't mean to be cynical about that, but I actually believe that that is a lot of what's happening. There is a branding of human-centric lighting that's different than what human-centric lighting actually is. And I want to get into the latter more than the former. So if we set aside the, the marketing idea, I'd like to come up with kind of an operational definition for what today, in 2019, what people generally mean when they talk about human-centric lighting. And I think it's something like this. So lighting specifically integrating both visual and non-visual effects and producing physiological and or psychological benefits on humans. The benefits is important. There's visual and non-visual, and it's physiological and psychological. So all those things are nested into that definition. As it happens, I'm not the one who wrote this definition. This was actually written by the International Commission on Illumination, and they do not use the phrase human-centric lighting. However, in a footnote, footnote number three, uh, they use the term integrative lighting, essentially integrating the visual and non-visual effects of light. You see note number three says the term human-centric lighting is used with similar meaning. So from my view as a, a scientist, an engineer, and educator, I'm going to prefer to use this term, integrative lighting, over human-centric lighting. However, if you want to substitute one for the other, understand that that's, that's what I'm doing here. So what's the opportunity, then, for integrative lighting? And here I mean in applied environments, in applied illuminating engineering, in the built environment. Let me give a kind of a high-level overview of how we can use optical radiation or light as a stimulus to affect people. I'm using the phrase optical radiation here because light traditionally is reserved for vision. Optical radiation more broadly can be considered as something for vision or photobiological health. We essentially have two pathways in our eyes. So the little graphs that I've shown on the left and right are the res uh, responses of our photoreceptors. So that's not the pathway itself, that's the input into the eye-brain pathway. So on the left, we have traditional photoreceptors for image forming. Those are the long, medium, and short wavelength sensitive cones and the rods. And on the right, we have the spectral sensitivity for melanopsin associated with the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cell. So on the left are, uh, and, and by the way, these things interact with one another when, when they go back to the pathways. So on the left, we have the, the things we traditionally think about when we consider lighting design. So we're dealing with visual performance, whether or not we can see a task, how effectively we can see. The visual experience, whether we like or dislike an environment, whether it creates a sense of relaxation or privacy or pleasure. And visual comfort, essentially meaning the avoidance of glare within our visual environment. So these are three things we often deal with in architectural lighting applications for vision. For non-image forming, I'm breaking them down into two primary categories, acute effects, uh, partly related to alerting effects, could be related to pupil dilation, and circadian effects, which are things that happen rhythmically over a 24-hour cycle. Now, collectively, all of these contribute to our physiological and psychological functioning. Um, and that's how I'm illustrating this, this pattern. So I want to come back to the, the right side, the non-image forming pathway, and talk a little bit more about some of the specific ways that we know that optical radiation will influence people. Change pupil size. Um, I, by the way, of course, I recognize that you can't read all those references down below. The, the font size is too small. If anybody wants these slides, they will be made available. So um, you can ask me or ask the organizers. I'll share the, the slides with them. We know um, optical radiation can acutely suppress melatonin, modulate alertness, body temperature, heart rate, shift the timing of the circadian rhythm. Um, and importantly, I added this one particularly for this, uh, uh, this group. Extended periods in windowless spaces are shown to have a detrimental effect on vitality, activity levels, and sleep, sleep quality. Um, other people have brought up the same. Um, these numbers have been brought up already this morning. So on average, people spend about 87 90%, something like that, of time indoors. By the way, in the US, about 6% of time is spent in vehicles. And that small sliver that's left is spent outside. So it, it's really small. Um, I think this has important implications. So effective design, construction, this has a big impact on quality of life. And ultimately, that's why we design lighting, that's why we design buildings. Um, architecture is basically grand scale art, and we're trying to create emotional environments that are also functional.
All right, so coming back to this diagram. Now, the importance of light level, light spectrum, temporal pattern, and spatial pattern, when we think about non-visual effect, non-image forming effects, are, are perhaps prioritized differently than they might be prioritized if we're only thinking about visual effects. And I'm going to, now I'm going to essentially take a stand about what I think are the most important elements of these variables that a lighting designer can manipulate if the outcome is intended to be health rather than just visual impacts. Now, with true integrative lighting, we're balancing both. In any particular environment, we're thinking, what's the importance of vision? What's the importance of the visual experience, the visual environment? What's the importance of photobiological health? Um, whether it's acute learning effects, whether it's circadian effects. Um, but let me focus on the latter, which is the health-oriented effects. And I want to start with the, the temporal pattern, which I believe is the number one influence on health-related aspects of light. The reason it's number one is because if you get the timing of light wrong indoors, that is when things can go haywire. So you might hear human-centric lighting. I've seen a lot of products that advertise human-centric lighting, which essentially all they are is very high correlated color temperature, blue-enriched light. And they say, this is human-centric lighting. Now, if you put that in your house and you light up your house to a very bright light level right before you go to sleep, that is not human-centric lighting. If you put it in your house in the morning, well, maybe it's human-centric lighting, but it becomes the application of that product, the timing of exposure to the radiation that determines whether or not that's going to be human-centric or non-human-centric lighting. So here's a typical pattern um, I'm showing. So 6 a.m., uh, noon, uh, 6 p.m., and midnight, and then repeat for the second day. We know that our body has a lot of temporal patterns already built in. So this is a typical melatonin. So I like to think about melatonin as kind of the Dracula of um, hormones. It comes out at night and goes away during the day. Um, this is cortisol, which is kind of working in a, in a sort of an opposite orientation. Not, not exactly opposite, but it comes out during the day and it goes, goes away at night. Um, we have alertness, which lags our cortisol by a little bit. Um, and then body temperature, and we have other cyclical patterns. But these patterns that are on the screen now are governed in large part by exposure of the body to light and driven largely by the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cell as that input. That photocell is peaks at uh, around 480 nanometers, which is in the short wavelength region of the spectrum. So timing is number one. So if you get the timing right, then quantity is number two and spectrum is number three. And I'm going to explain this with one figure. Um, this is from the work of the Lighting Research Center. On the, on the uh, horizontal axis is something called circadian light. This could also be melanopic lux. It's an indication of quantity of light in logarithmic units. So in the dark gray is outdoors at night, then indoors home, indoors office, and then outdoors daytime as you go to the right. Basically what I want to show with this, I'm not sure how to use a laser pointer, so, um, is that we have two levers on here. There's a small lever, which is color temperature of white light. So you can see where it's labeled as 300 lux or 300 lux. The upper one is for daylight and the lower one is for incandescence. So you can move a little bit up that curve if you change correlated color temperature. But if you really want to move up that curve, you need to do it with a lot more light. So it's quantity of light that really, really matters. So you can think about it this way. If you really want to affect circadian photobiology or uh, photobiological responses, quantity of light is a sledgehammer, and spectrum is basically a rubber mallet. And finally, spatial patterns should be considered with quantity and spectrum. So traditionally, at least in North America, guidelines are based on horizontal luminance. Well, our eyes face forward, not down. So it's actually vertical surface illumination that really makes sense. Um, and so this is something that needs to be considered on par. If you're designing for circadian photobiology, it's important to have vertical surface illumination while at the same time minimizing as much as possible visual discomfort. So what then is human-centric lighting? I have 41 seconds to explain. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to try to make this simple. Um, it's basically in three categories. During the day, we want light that is high in melanopic content. That means blue enriched or a lot more short wavelength. In the hours before we're going to bed, we want light that is low in melanopic content, and we want to sleep in darkness. That's it. It's that simple. Um, so I, I want to explain. I just have two more slides here. Um, buildings where people sleep 
require three conditions. One condition after wake up, which is high in melanopic content. One condition in the hours before bed, which is very low in melanopic content. That could be dim, that could be warm or light. And then a third, which is sleep in darkness. That might even mean put blackout blinds on your windows so you don't have light street lights coming in. Um, this is actually more complicated. The big opportunity for human-centric lighting is actually more, I think, about residential lighting than it is about office lighting because residential lighting requires these three different types of lighting. I shouldn't just say residential. This could also be retirement facilities, assisted care living. It could be hospital environments. Um, but it's environments more generally where people sleep. People where work learn, schools, offices, actually, it's quite simple. During the all, all the hours, provide light that is high in melanopic content. It doesn't, you don't need dimming. Um, you don't need adjustable CCT lighting. You don't need something that's going to change CCT after lunch or anything like that. Make it bright, make it blue enhanced, make it melanopically rich, and that's actually what's going to provide the, the best system for people. So all those things that are advertised as human-centric lighting that have complex controls and are intended for office environments, not so much. It, it doesn't take something complicated. Now, finally, my last comment I want to make is that clearly you can understand how daylight gives us human-centric lighting to begin with. It's bright during the day, it's dark at night, changes, changes its intensity over the course of the day. Um, and I'm one minute over, so with that I will say thank you. <laughs>